If you had to gamble your life in terrifying games where losing gets you executed, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death games in Usagoi. Everyone is going to regret meeting this man. A group of fishermen are sitting around a table and gambling, when Bakuhir approaches them, asking if he can join in. This man mocks him, explaining he's too young, but that's when he throws down 1 million yen as a bet, insisting he'll beat him. The gambler takes on the challenge with his own 1 million yen, and sits down to roll the dice. But as he reveals what's in the bowl, the man is shocked that he's just lost the game. That's when Baku suddenly takes one of the dice before stomping on it, revealing that it's been weighted with a magnet. He knew the man used a metal plate to win every bet, so Baku hit his own magnet in his betting money. That made one of the dice flip over and gave the cheater a taste of his own medicine. The man's an expert at outsmarting con artists and beating them at their own game, but soon he'll play through three challenges that will keep escalating in danger. Later that night, he meets up with an old friend who has some news about an organization called the Kakuro Club, which Baku was exiled from. A genius scientist named Iki has figured out a revolutionary way to mine a material that could replace oil, but after his lab was destroyed by some of the club's members, he's now determined to infiltrate it so he can take down its leader. Baku knows if he wants to stop Kakuro from ruining people's lives, he can't let the corrupt leader stay in power, and decides to go to Tokyo to put his plan into action. Meanwhile, the scientist Iki is playing poker with the Japanese Minister of Finance and questions why he's come to challenge him specifically. The man reveals that he needs more money for his next political campaign, but also wants to control Iki and his groundbreaking discovery. With that, the men continue to play, betting huge stacks of gold bullion, and the scientist manages to keep on winning each hand. In the sixth round, the minister goes all in, but when they flip their cards, the scientist reveals a full house and wins the game. Suspicious, the minister demands a rematch, claiming he can't afford the payment, but the referee insists he must settle the debt. He makes it clear there will be severe consequences if the minister doesn't comply, but the older man ignores him, ordering his bodyguard to kick them out. Grabbing the referee, he tries to drag him away, and suddenly gets thrown over the table. The bodyguard calls the reinforcements, and they start to shoot at him, forcing the man to take cover. They try to take him down, but the referee brutally fights them off, shooting them with a stolen gun. With all the minister's men dead, he punishes the gambler and shoves his face into a jacuzzi, drowning him to death. Later, the referee hands over the scientist his winnings, and requests that Iki make him his designated referee. The man agrees, and gets into his car, where he makes it clear to his driver that this won't stop until he's beaten the leader. Okay, that was intense. This old guy here was the Japanese Minister of Finance, which is one of the highest government positions in the country. It's the man's job to manage public debt and form tax policies for the citizens of Japan, and now he's just been murdered. What's terrifying is that these guys walked away like there would be no consequences for their actions because they're members of one of the most powerful organizations in the world. If you haven't figured it out already, the Kakuro Club is a secret society of gamblers that help facilitate high-stakes games between its members and enforce the debts to be paid. Since its members may up some of the richest and most powerful people, they have widespread influence across networks all over the world. For example, in an earlier game the Baku here played against the leader of the club, he lost his own membership, gambling that there would be a plane flying over them in the next hour. With one click of a button, the leader stopped every single plane in the sky so that he could rig the game and crush his opponent. This kind of unchecked power is absolutely horrifying because it means that the lives of Japanese citizens are at the mercy of the most influential club members' gambling habits, and nobody can stop them. What's even worse is that they've been around since the 1500s under the Izuchi Momoyama period. This was a pivotal time in Japanese history where the feudal states became unified under a central government, so it's no accident that the Kakuro Club has established so much influence. Imagine if the President of the United States was losing a game of high-stakes poker, offered the launch codes to the nuclear arsenal, and lost his bet. There's nothing in the Kakuro rulebook that would stop this from happening, and with enforcement officers like this guy, the President would have no choice but to honor his debts. This is why Baku here wants to take down their leader, but he's not the only one. Iki here also wants to destroy them after he lost his lab. The backstory here is that he approached this finance minister to request funding for his research so he could share it with the world. But the man turned him away and sabotaged his life's work. Now he's out for revenge, and that's why if I were Baku, I would try to convince this man that we should be working together. Even though he's clearly dangerous, the enemy of my enemy is a friend, and if he realizes that Baku here can help him get closer to his goal, it makes a lot of sense to join forces in taking this evil organization down. The next morning, this kid Kaji is getting off work and approaches this vending machine to get himself a drink. But when he reaches down, he discovers he's just won the jackpot. That means he's received another can for free, but quickly realizes someone is watching him. Baku stares thirstily at the drink in his hand, so the young man offers him the freebie. Later, they sit down together, and Kaji explains that his life has been on a downward spiral for a while now, as he tosses his empty can, missing the trash bin. He walks over to pick it up, but just as he kneels down, the young man is stopped by someone. 
Looking up, he sees two loan sharks who are here to collect one and a half million yen of debt. Suddenly, Baku kicks them off to defend the kid, lying that Kaji has connections with an incredible lawyer who could easily get them sentenced to five years in prison. Terrified, the loan sharks run away as fast as they can, and Baku asks his new friend how much he owes in total. The kid confesses that he's 2.2 million yen in the hole, but Baku knows exactly what to do to fix his problem. That night, he takes his new friend to an underground casino where they carefully observe a game of roulette. Taking out candy, Baku tells them that when he eats this at the betting table, Kaji must put all his money on the number he doesn't pick. With the plan established, the gambler approaches the table, placing bets on almost every single number except for 20 and 9. When the wheel spins, the dealer announces 28, meaning the gambler has won and decides to bet again. This time, he puts his money on every number except 20, 28, and 9, raising his bet to 10,000 yen. They watch as the wheel spins, but when it comes to a stop, it lands on 9. He's lost over 350,000 yen in one move, but determined to win it back, he pulls the remaining cash out of his jacket to double down. That's when he asks the dealer if the same number will win, and the man says it's unlikely, with no idea he's just fallen for a trap. Satisfied, Baku pulls out the candy from his pocket, and his friend realizes this is his opportunity to strike. Noticing that almost every number has been bet on, Kaji goes all in at the last second, and the gambler quickly figures out the dealer controls where the ball will land as it stops on 9. The friends congratulate each other for tricking the dealer and have just won 5 million yen. That's one game down with two more to go. They begin to leave but find their way blocked by the mistress of the casino who offers to play a bonus game. All the gambler has to do is guess what gender the next person to leave the elevator will be, but if he loses, they'll have to give up their winnings. Baku calls her out knowing she's trying to pull a trick and steal their hard-earned money. The woman applauds him for figuring it out, but wants to know why he's back. Baku had his Kakuro membership revoked, and the leader can easily order his death for returning to Tokyo, but he simply tells her they'll find out soon, and leaves the casino with his friend. Okay, this is completely unfair. Not only are the Kakuro the most powerful organization in the world, but from what we've seen, they're also dirty cheaters. Somehow, Baku realized that this dealer was controlling the ball, but from what we can see, it's not obvious that he's cheating at all. The dealer isn't making strange gestures, his hands are always visible, and there aren't any mechanisms around that look like the game is rigged. Now, it's important to point out that anyone who's visited a casino should know that winning in roulette has some of the worst odds of any game. There's too much left to chance because there's no way to accurately predict where the ball Ball is going to drop. They also happen to be playing on an American roulette wheel, which has his extra double zero space here. That means the house edge is even higher at 5.26% compared to the European wheel, which only has a house edge of 2.7%. It's not a game for winners, but having said that, there are some common tactics that roulette players use to stay profitable as long as they can. One of the best methods is called the D'Alembert system, which uses this part of the table here. Since there are only even or odd numbers, this basically gives you a 50% chance of winning, which is great. The downside is that it has a very low payout compared to everywhere else on the table. Each losing hand, you increase your bet by one unit, and every time you win, you decrease it by the same amount. The advantage here is that if you end up on a winning streak, you can capitalize on it more than other strategies would. It's one of the most profitable ways to play the game, but Baku here is playing a very different strategy. The man is placing a chip on virtually every number, and if he wins one, he's going to be paid 36 times what he bet. The downside is if he's placing chips on all but two numbers, he's only making modest winnings. So when he's trying to earn over 2 million yen back for Kaji here, this will take a long time to achieve. With all this said, the only way this strategy is effective for winning is if he knows the dealer is going to cheat, and that's why he used his friend to bet big on the only number he left open. Roulette was the game of choice because once the ball is moving, the dealer can't stop it, and it was the perfect setup. Now the biggest thing to point out about this whole situation is that this guy is not doing this just from the kindness of his heart. We already know he has an agenda to take down the leader of the Kakuro organization, but since he doesn't have his membership anymore, he'll have to find other ways to achieve his goal. With this in mind, we can't think it's an accident that he's wandered on this guy who shows a little bit of luck at the vetting machine, and within a couple hours, he's literally gambling with the man's money at a Kakuro-owned casino. It's sussy as hell, and if I were this kid, even if he's just won me back the money, there's clearly something wrong with the entire situation, and since he's a very smart person, it makes him extremely dangerous. Outside, Kaji asks Baku what he's going to do to avoid getting killed and offers to help. His friend warns it's too dangerous for him to take on the Kakuro organization and walks away, leaving him with the prize money. Back at the casino, the evil scientist is playing a game of poker as the staff members watch him, shocked that he hasn't screwed up once and is about to win 55 million yen. That's when the mistress enters the room, revealing the man has been targeting Kakuro members and has no choice but to beat him. The woman faces off against him, but when they throw down their hands, Iki wins.
kids. He's about to leave, but suddenly Baku approaches the scientists and insists they play a game of heads or tails. Flipping the coin into the air, he catches it, and Iki here picks tails, but the coin has landed on heads. Refusing to play along, he makes it clear that he'll only face off against him if he becomes a member of the Kakuro Club again and leaves the building. Later that night, the casino owner goes to a bar where Baku has been waiting for her and asks where he can get another Kakuro membership. The mistress explains there are rumors an old man in Yokohama is willing to gamble his membership, but no one has ever won. That's when she realizes Baku has already left for the subway, and the man is surprised to find Kaji waiting for him there. His friend asks if he can work with him to play against the Kakuro organization, and Baku agrees, reassuring the kid that he'll be very useful. The next morning, Kaji sits down on a fountain to relax when a strange old man sits next to him and asks if he wants to play a game. Interrupting their conversation, Baku asks if he can join too, and the old man accepts, but they're about to find themselves in the middle of a legitimate death game. He takes them to a forest on his property, and they enter a tent where he explains the rules. The players must work together to steal five keys from his five pets, but there's a catch. One of the boys must wear a device on their leg that will keep track of the time, and if they manage to unlock it using the keys, then they'll win 10 million yen. Curious, Baku asks if they'll be facing something big like a tiger, and the old man reassures them his pets are much weaker, but never explains what happens when time runs out. It's suspicious, but that's when the gambler asks who the gentleman behind him is, and he introduces himself as a referee from the Kakuro Club. Deciding to take advantage of the situation, the gambler insists they're leaving unless the old man offers his membership, and the guy promises it as an extra reward for beating the game. The referee accepts the conditions, and Baku thanks him for approving the change before putting a pen into his jacket. With that decided, the old man pulls out a high-tech shackle and attaches it to Kaji's ankle, warning them they have two hours as the game finally begins. Okay, these people are taking this way too far. First of all, this man was way too excited when he asked Kaji to join his game. Even though this was obviously a setup, this is exactly the kind of person your parents tell you not to accept candy from, but he's not the only one that we should be suspicious of. Earlier, Kaji was actually told that this Kakuro business is too dangerous for him, but less than 24 hours later, he's being used as bait to join a death game. This friendship is starting to look a little bit like exploitation, and if Kaji was thinking straight, he would be making sure he had a lot more to gain from all this instead of doing everything for free. Now, right from the start, these guys had every reason to think this was a death game before walking inside. First of all, the casino woman told us that nobody has ever won. Secondly, the place is in the middle of the forest, far enough away from the public that nobody would hear screams for help. It's also extremely suspicious that two security guards would be needed if it already has barbed wire around the entire perimeter. Look at these guys. They aren't dressed for the environment at at all, meaning they're only here for us, and that's why Baku should be rethinking this entire situation. Now, the man is an expert in catching rid games, but that doesn't automatically turn him into Rambo, and since this is a death game, I would make sure we were in a position to use our strengths to our advantage and find a way to cheat. From what we've seen so far, the Kakuro Club has strict rules of enforcing debts to be settled, but they have been very relaxed if players are cheating. When Baku here lost his match to the leader of the organization, the man literally blocked all planes from flying above them in order to win. We've also seen this woman running a corrupt casino as a Kakuro member, and with this in mind, it should be fair to assume that breaking some rules is an acceptable tactic if we do it the right way. That's why if it were me, I would steal this map behind the referee. It's obviously the layout of the entire perimeter, and these marks are going to be useful to inform us about where potential threats are, as well as the terrain. This gives us a huge advantage we wouldn't have otherwise, because now we have options for more potential strategies. With no idea what kind of threats are out there, studying the topography is going to put us in a better position to steal the keys and win the game. I would also grab these walkie-talkies on the shelf behind them in case we get split up from our partner for any reason. There's always a chance that the channel is being monitored, but right now without knowing exactly what we're facing, we need as many resources as we can get. The players wander through the forest searching for the keys when they spot a man dressed as a soldier. As soon as he sees them, he fires his gun and Kaji here realizes he was shot with a real bullet. Terrified, the friends run for their lives and the soldier chases after them. They duck into a ditch hiding from the old man's pet and try to figure out what to do next. Kaji attempts to call the police for help, but realizes there's no safe Signal. The gambler makes it clear that the Kakuro Club always runs death games with high stakes, and that means this timer is a bomb that will explode unless they get the keys. He's regretting ever coming here, but Baku reassures him that he's got a plan. With no idea where his targets are, the soldier checks his GPS and discovers one of them is nearby. Walking over to the tree line, he finds Baku hiding and shoots at him, but misses. The gambler proposes he let them go, promising to give each pet 2 million yen if they let the players win. The soldier bluffs, telling him he'll consider the offer, and tries to shoot the gambler, but as he moves to get a better angle, Kaji pulls him off his feet. He drags the soldier into a trunk, overwhelming him with pain, and quickly disarms the man. The gambler searches him for supplies and finds one of the keys, before plugging it into the device, leaving four more to go. In another part of the forest, one of the soldiers tracks down the boys and overhears them talking inside of a shed. They have no idea he's there and 
and shoots through the door, but when he checks to see if they're dead, the man realizes he's made a mistake. The players had left behind a phone playing a voice message, and he runs out of the building searching for them, only for Kaji to quickly knock him out. They take his key and head through the forest, when Baku suddenly stops his friend. He noticed there was a tripwire set up, and they disarm the trap, making sure it can't be used against them. Later, two more soldiers arrive and realize their targets must have passed through here. That's when the kid limps out of the forest and makes a break for it, yelling that he's been spotted. The soldiers chase after him and catching up, they shoot at the two players. The boys collapse to the ground, but when the men walk over to finish them off, their legs are cut by a hidden tripwire. The boys have been setting this trap just as the soldiers found them and quickly loot the men for their keys, with only one more left to find. Later, this soldier is keeping watch over the forest when he spots the two players stumbling out from the trees and shoots them. Looking for their bodies, he realizes that the people he shot were the other soldiers dressed as the players, and that's when Baku holds him up at gunpoint. Kaji quickly takes the last key he needs and plugs it into the timer, stopping it with only 17 seconds remaining. The timer unlocks, and that means they finally beat the game, but that's when they hear the old man shouting orders at the soldier. Baku responds over the radio, making it clear they've taken down all of his men, but the Kakuro Club member has one last trick up his sleeve. Heading outside, he yells at something in a tree to wake up, and after administering some medicine, this beast of a man sprints straight into the forest to hunt down his newest victims. Okay, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. First of all, the old man is obviously cheating because technically they've already won the game. So setting new enemies after them only proves that these Kakuro members will play as dirty as they can. This referee isn't doing a damn thing to stop them, and we should keep this in mind next time when we need to face any other Kakuro members in future games. The next thing to point out is that the old man is sending a juiced up barbarian to hunt them down, even though he already knows they've taken out his five soldiers, all of whom had rifles. The guy should have realized that at this point, the players would have collected all of the weapons they can carry and be so heavily armed that the beast man shouldn't stand a chance. It seems like a horrible strategy, but not nearly as horrible as the one Baku used only a moment ago. He had a decent strategy to move the tripwire because the soldiers would know where it was originally placed. The problem is that they needed them to get within less than 5 meters, dodge their bullets, and pretend to get hit, all so that they could trick them into stepping into their trap. It's so stupid that they honestly deserve to be dead, because there was an easier way to handle this entire situation. As I mentioned earlier, part of my strategy would have been to take any useful items I could from the tent before entering the game, and since we know that the Kakuro referee gives a lot of freedom for creative problem solving, it's reasonable to assume he would let us take the map and the walkie-talkies. With this in mind, I would have used the walkie-talkie here and and planted it in one of the bushes, speaking through it from a distance. This will lure them towards the tripwire, because they'll think someone is hiding nearby. Then, we can have our friend jump out and run through the trap, reducing the amount of time he's being shot at before they trip the wire. This strategy keeps our friend a lot safer and doesn't need us to pretend to be shot in order for them to walk through the trap. I would also use the topographical map we took to evaluate where the best place to set a trap would be. For example, it's reasonable to assume that if soldiers are looking for us, they're going to be at higher altitudes because looking and running down a hill will be a lot easier to catch someone. This map helps us understand what the soldiers might be factoring into their strategies to catch us and use the terrain against them. If they're running downhill, they'll be going faster, meaning it's more likely they won't notice the tripwire than if they were running uphill, because then the wire would be at their eye line shortly before they reach it, making it easier for them to spot. Terrified of the old man's secret weapon, one of the soldiers makes a break for it, but he's knocked away by the barbarian. The killer lunges forward and lands in front of the players as they try to shoot him down, but discovers he can dodge bullets. It's too dangerous to take him on, so the players immediately run for it as the creature follows after them. Meanwhile, the old man brags to the referee that Rotom is a super soldier he created and considers him his greatest masterpiece, but with one weakness. He will fall asleep within 15 minutes, and the man has no idea he's just made his biggest mistake. Back in the forest, the friends run into a shed and Kaji freaks out, insisting they need to quit this game, but the gambler refuses. He has a plan, and when he notices a bottle on a shelf, the guy realizes there's a way to escape. Outside, the super soldier arrives at the shed and finds Baku waving a red flag at him as his partner goes running off. It makes him angry, and the man goes sprinting straight at the gambler, but the player dodges all of his attacks. Exhausted, Baku goes over to a tree and catches his breath when the soldier finds him. The guy picks him up and throws him across the clearing, but then Kaji comes out of hiding, firing his gun at an explosive to distract the super soldier. Seizing his opportunity, the kid throws the jar of ethanol into the air, and the gambler shoots it, blinding their opponent. He's reached his physical limits, and the soldier collapses to the ground unconscious. With no enemies left, Baku taunts the old man that they've managed to beat his masterpiece, and that makes him realize he somehow overheard him. 
Rushing over to the referee, he checks the pen Baku gave him and realizes it was a listening device. He's been outsmarted, but since it was never declared against the rules, the players have beaten the game. Entering the tent, Baku brags that his team has won and the old man is furious. He pulls a sword out of his cane and tries to attack them, but the referee disarms him, stabbing the man in his foot. The game is over and the boys are 10 million yen richer. That makes two games down with one more to go. Heading outside, the referee gives the Kakuro Club membership to Kaji since his friend isn't allowed to rejoin and hands over his business card, requesting to be his designated referee. The next morning, the boys drive out into the Japanese countryside where they're going to be playing the next game. The referee leads them into a room where they find tons of people watching on a massive screen and meet their opponent. It's the scientist Iki, and he asks them how much money they brought. Baku reveals that he only brought 50 million yen, but the scientist aide explains they need 2 billion to compete before pulling out a gun. That's when the friend aims his rifle at her and accidentally pulls the trigger, shooting one of the cameras. It's a tense situation, but the referee interrupts, proposing the spectators and invest in Baku, and if he wins this game, they'll triple their investment. With that, the spectators go into a frenzy, adding their support, until Baku finally has 2 billion to gamble. The audience begins demanding they be executed by hanging if they lose, and the scientist sits down at a table to decide what game will be played, tying a headband around his eyes. The old referee shuffles around several card decks, and Iki here slams his hand down, making his choice. Okay, this just got a lot more intense. We're finally playing a game with extremely high stakes against a scientist who up to this point hasn't been beaten by anyone. It's a terrifying situation. And now with 2 billion yen and our lives on the line, we have to execute this perfectly if we want to survive. It's not going to be easy. And that's especially true when you look at how flawed Baku's strategies were in the last game. The old man sent this barbarian to kill them, but the gambler's solution was to take him out with a bottle of ethanol. The problem is that they already knew the man was fast enough to dodge bullets, so there's no reason he wouldn't be able to dodge this as well. In fact, this strategy requires even more accuracy because they have to activate the distraction, perfectly throw the bottle into the air, and then shoot it. There's so little margin for error here that it's clearly one of the worst ideas you could come up with. They should have used their stolen weapons with more strategy, and if both of them had fired their guns until they ran out of ammo, it would be almost impossible for him to evade all the bullets. Now with that said, this new game has a lot more money on the line, but what's encouraging is that there's an audience, and this is a really big deal. With 2 billion yen invested, the gamblers are going to feel extremely upset if they know that the entire game was rigged from the beginning. Since the Kakuro Club has a track record of letting players use dirty tricks, we should be able to convince the audience to ask for extra measures so they aren't being cheated out of their money. This puts their interest in alignment with ours, so we can influence the terms of the game. That's why if it were me, I would make them draw a card game by an objective third party from a bag so they can't pay. Peak. You might be thinking that this is the same as tying a headband around the man's eyes, but it makes a huge difference. Right now, we have good reason to think he might have already found a way to cheat, and the more people there are in the room, the more opportunities there are for him to gain information he shouldn't have. Just like in chess matches, people can find extremely well-hidden methods to receive information. That's why using a third party and a bag makes a huge difference here, because it would reduce the chances for unfair influence from anyone else in the room who might be secretly helping the players. It's also such a simple request that it would be extremely unlikely the referee would deny it. Trusting anyone here would be a huge mistake, and if you aren't taking every measure to reduce the possibility of cheating, then we're only making it harder for ourselves. Looking at the cover the deck he chose, the old man announces they will play Hangman Old Maid and breaks down the rules. Two sets of numbered cards will be used, and the players will be given a hand, stealing one card each turn from their opponents to make pairs. Whoever holds the card with the Hangman on it at the end of the game will lose, but there's a catch. There are five different versions of the Hangman, with a number from one to five, and this number represents how many pieces of the gallows are going to be assembled. When someone accumulates all 11 parts, they will be executed. That means this challenge could end in as little as three turns, and the referee adds that sharing of information during the game is prohibited, but they can't cheat if they're not caught. The scientist referee shuffles the cards around and announces that Baku will go first. With that, the spectators are hidden from view and the cards are handed to the players, but that's when the friend notices Baku has the highest Old Maid card already. Thinking quickly, the gambler tells the scientist he should take this card since it's not the Old Maid, but the man steals the other instead. Dead. Iki has won the round, and that's when a group of the Kakuro Club agents walk out to assemble five pieces of the gallows. In the next hand, the players trade their cards to make pairs until they both only have two left. Taking his time, Baku taunts the man that his glasses are reflecting what's in his hand and confidently takes one, but that was his biggest mistake. To his surprise, he's stolen the old maid four, and when the scientist goes next, Iki reveals he's just made a pair. That means he's won a 
another round, and the agents continue building the gallows, making it clear that Baku might die soon. They continue playing, and the scientist makes another pair, taunting the gambler to try his luck. It's a tense situation, and the man tries to figure out which one is safe, but Iki doesn't budge. He's now revealing any tells, so Baku angrily takes one, discovering that it's another old maid. Desperate to win, he offers up his last two cards, and just as the scientist reaches out, he shovels them around to confuse his opponent. Suddenly, the old man picks the two, leaving the gambler with the old maid, and now he's one game away from being executed. It's a hopeless situation, and Baku apologizes to his friend, admitting that he's finally met his match. But the others have no idea, he'll soon outsmart everyone. Okay, this is not looking good. Baku here has 10 out of 11 pieces of the gallows assembled, and one more old maid will get him hanged. Every time he tries to play a clever trick, the scientist somehow keeps finding ways to win, but there is one thing he could have been doing from the very beginning. In a situation like this, playing the game matters a lot less than playing the player. In old maid, there aren't very many gameplay strategies involved, because it has a lot more to do with luck than anything else. That's why telling your opponents to choose a certain card is a very effective strategy, because instead of his card selection being random, you're now forcing them to make an decision based on whether or not they think you are telling the truth. It narrows their thinking down to a more predictable outcome and helps you influence their decision making even in a game of chance whether they like it or not. Baku did this at first, but the problem was that he didn't continue using the strategy after every single turn, and it could have had a lot more influence on the game. Now aside from this, there's actually a more important observation we can make here, because even though they're both facing execution for losing, this scientist is way too calm. If you look at Baku's face compared to Iki's, it's not difficult to tell that one is a lot more stressed out than the other, but what's interesting is that this is an actual pattern in his behavior during high stakes games. Earlier, he played the casino owner, and since she's playing with a home court advantage, you'd think her chances of winning would be much higher. It's her club with cameras around the room, and she could have had in-ear headphones if the woman wanted to cheat. Despite all these options at her disposal, the scientist here actually looked bored, and it's a clear sign he already knew the outcome of the game before it began. Nothing surprised him. And with this kind of confidence, it's logical to assume that he must have been cheating. Now, at the moment, losing one more turn will get us executed, and according to the rules by the referee, he said that cheating is only allowed if you haven't been caught. With this in mind, we need to identify how this man might be gaming the system, and reveal it so that he's discovered qualified from playing. If it were me, I would use this next round of the game to test every possible boundary so that we can figure out what might be affecting his cheating strategy the most. The first thing I would do is ask the referee to make sure he doesn't have any earpieces or special equipment in his glasses that are giving him an unfair advantage. If nothing is found, I would then make sure to change up the system to interfere with the strategies and make him select my cards from the floor instead of my hand. This means they would all be face down making it impossible for anyone in the arena to see my cards and feed him the information. Next, I would tell my friend to quietly move to the other side of the room so that we can try to peek at our opponent's cards. If he has an old maid card, our friend can then try to signal how many cards to the left or right it is in his hands. Now this could be risky, because the referee said we aren't allowed to share information, but if the friend uses very subtle gestures like a tap on his arm, we can count them to indicate the number of cards, while a shift in his body weight could indicate that we should count from the left or the right. Lastly, if the game is getting down to the wire, and I only have a few cards left, I would pick them up off the floor, hide my cards inside my shirt, and rip the old maid card in half. This will make it look like two different cards in my hand, and I would then hold them close to my body so nobody can see our trick. This doubles his chances of picking it, and if they don't find out what I've done until it's been selected, the referee would force him to keep the entire card. Moving on to the next round, the gambler realizes he's got the old maid three card and is terrified of losing. That's when his friend cheers him on and reminds him he can't give up. Touched by his belief, Baku thanks him for the support and turns to face his opponent. They begin taking cards from each other and quickly making pairs until the gambler only has two cards left. The side scientist reaches out to pick one, but then Baku comes up with a clever idea and suddenly drops his cards. They fall on the ground, exposing that one of them is the old maid three, and the gambler picks them up, confident that he's already won. Taking out candy, he bites into it, and Iki demands he hold up his cards. The man turns around to shuffle them, but when he faces his opponent, Baku holds them face down in the air. He asks the scientist if he'd like the top or the bottom, completely throwing off Iki, and the man reluctantly picks the bottom card, and that was his mistake. He's just taken the old maid three, and Baku goes next, confidently stealing the man's three. That means he's won his first round and might be able to beat this game. They continue playing, and as soon as the match starts, Baku steps out of his opponent's view. The scientist has no reaction until he realizes that the gambler has moved and angrily takes one of his cards, making a pair. When it's Baku's turn to choose, he starts tapping his arm and considers which one to steal, making his opponent furious. Frustrated, Iki demands they set a time limit so nobody can stall, and the referee agrees, announcing the players will have one minute to steal their opponent's cards from now on. Taking his turn, Baku 
Baku confidently reaches out and picks the three from his opponent's hand, making him the winner again. The situation is getting tense, and the gambler is confident that whoever starts off with the old maid will lose. When the sixth round begins, Kaji realizes that his friend has the old maid five in his hand and is terrified they'll lose. But Baku has a plan. Once they've made their pairs, the gambler is given the first chance to pick a card and takes a seven from his opponent's hand. With that done, he starts shuffling his own cards while stomping on the floor and distracts his opponent. He's figured out exactly how the scientist has won and offers up his last two cards. Iki only has 10 seconds to make a choice, and he quickly picks one, taking the old maid. He's completely off his game now and angrily holds out his cards, falling right into Baku's trap. The gambler suddenly walks up to the man and peeks at his cards. The scientist A tries to stop him, but the referee reminds her she can't share information. There's no way they can win now, and Baku walks back to his side before quickly taking the eight. Iki thinks the man must have taken the old maid, but then the gambler separates his cards and reveals he knows how the scientist cheated. Iki must be looking at Baku's hand using the cameras in the room, but he tricked him by drawing on the aid card to make it look like the old maid. That means the scientist has lost, and the boys celebrate their victory, relieved they survived. That makes three games down with Baku and Kaji as the winners. With that, the old referee officially announces the winner, and they'll be moving on to the execution. The gallows have now been completed, and Baku explains to the audience that the scientist must have implanted a device into his body to see through nearby cameras. But there was a problem. One of the cameras was destroyed before the game even started, and the respective changes between each camera every 10 seconds. When the perspective switched to the broken camera, Baku was able to use that to turn the game around and win. It was a clever way to cheat, and he accuses the man of being a liar, but that makes his referee furious. He lunges at the gambler and tries to murder him, but the older man stops him at the last second. The two of them fight it out, and the older referee gets the upper hand before brutally breaking the young man's neck. With no one to protect him, the scientist accepts his fate and walks over to the gallows, but before the noose can be wrapped around his neck, he asks the gambler why he wanted to become the new leader of the Kakaro. Baku admits that he wants world peace, and that makes the scientist laugh. It's the same ridiculous dream he had, and wishes Baku luck in his mission. There's nothing anyone can do to stop the execution, and the loser's deaths make the survivors more determined to seize control of the organization. One year later, the team drives out into the Japanese countryside and returns to the tunnel for a game. Entering the arena, Baku finds the leader of the Kakaro Club waiting for him and promises to take his position. After everything that's happened, he's learned a valuable lesson. Cheaters always prosper. But what do you think? How would you beat Usagoi? Let me know in the comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How to Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.